Hello, I am Adam Kalora. On behalf of my fellow authors, as well as our colleagues at IBM, it's my pleasure to virtually present our International Symposium on Computer Architecture paper, the IBM Z15 High Frequency Mainframe Branch Predictor. And yes, I said mainframe. Mainframes are used throughout the world today, and most people don't even realize it. From banks, credit card companies, airlines, insurance, retailers, supply chains, universities, utilities, governments, and even you rely on these systems. The mainframe is a highly secure, highly scalable system that boasts enormous processing capabilities with a high level of reliability, availability, and serviceability, something we call RAS. It could be considered the original cloud platform with the ability to virtualize thousands of machines running a plethora of mixed workloads simultaneously, all the while being super efficient. And it even runs Linux. These qualities exemplify an enterprise system. These enterprise systems are relied upon because they must not go down. They cannot go down. The livelihood of the business depends on them. Now, this is what a modern mainframe, the IBM Z15, looks like. Depending on custom requirements, the Z15 is available in various models and sizes, from a single industry standard 19-inch rack to a fully configured four cabinet system. It supports up to 12 I.O. cages for fiber channel communication to things like DASD storage devices, Ethernet adapters, and compression and encryption engines. There are various power distribution options, water and air cooling, support PCs for system control firmware, its own redundant local area network, and even space for future customer use. Up to five water-cooled central processing complexes, known as CPCs, contain up to 40 terabytes of DRAM main memory. Within each CPC resides four central processing chips that contain the processor core. Now let's dive into the CP chip to get to our star, the branch predictor. There are 12 processor cores on one CP chip built in 14 nanometer technology. Each core has a private level one and level two split instruction and data cache. Shared level three EDRAM cache occupies the center with cross chip communication, memory and IO modules at the edges. There are over 9 billion transistors and over 15 miles of wire on a single CP chip. Within a core, we find our quintessential core building blocks. The ICM, Instruction Cache and Merge, sends instruction text to the IDU, Instruction Dispatch and Decode Unit, which determines instruction boundaries, decodes, and places risk-like micro-ops into groups. It then dispatches the groups to the ISU, Instruction Sequencing Unit, which issues instructions to the LSU, Load Store Unit, FXU, Fixed Point Unit, and VFU, Vector Floating Point Unit. Architected state is checkpointed in the RU or recovery unit for processor recovery. Hardware compression and encryption is accelerated in the COP or coprocessor. Address translation for the data and instruction caches is performed in the XU or translator unit. Now, processing starts, however, with the IFB instruction fetch and branch prediction, which, in addition to managing pipeline restarts, contains the branch predictor with the predictor here highlighted in blue. Each core operates continuously at 5.2 gigahertz. With such a fast clock speed, the core has a very deep pipeline. The Z15 core is superscalar, out of order, and supports simultaneous multi-threading. Fetching, decode, dispatch, and completion, or put away, is in order, whereas instruction issued to the 10 execution units is out of order. Up to six instructions can be dispatched and completed per cycle. Now, the key here is recognizing that because of the deep processor pipeline, it's imperative to keep the pipeline on the correct code path for as long as possible to sustain the high completion rate. We want to minimize inflection points known as restarts. These restarts can occur at dispatch, instruction execution, and post-completion. Restarts are handled by the IFB, which kicks off the instruction fetching and branch prediction at the same virtual address simultaneously. Even though the branch prediction pipeline starts at the same time as fetching, beyond that, it operates independently of the main processor pipeline. This is why we refer to the branch predictor as being asynchronous. Both start at the same point upon a pipeline restart, but after that, they are somewhat independent. When the iCache fetches a maximum of 32 bytes of virtual address space per cycle, the branch predictor searches a 64-byte address space each cycle. The branch prediction pipeline searches sequential 64-byte blocks until a taken branch is encountered, at which point the pipeline self-redirects to the target of the branch, where searching continues. 
At the end of each six cycle pipeline, if branches are found within the 64 byte address space, a prediction bundle is made with up to eight branches per bundle, but a maximum of only one taken prediction. The branch predictor uses what's called a stream to keep track of where it is in relation to the last pipeline restart. Streams start at zero with a restart and increment upon each taken prediction found. As the 64-byte virtual address sections are searched, a double quad word count is maintained to know how many 32-byte chunks the predictor has searched within the current stream. A predicted taken branch increments the stream count and resets the double quad word count. Most of the branch predictors tables reside in SRAM-based arrays, which, when indexed in the B0 cycle, output contents two cycles later in B2. The branch predictor knows the address space the core pipeline is in because of the pipeline restart. Hit detect, therefore, is started in the B2 cycle and is finished in B3, where each of up, the, up to eight branches are ordered amongst themselves and has their direction determined. We report up to and including the first taken branch encountered. Finalization of the prediction is done in B4 with the muxing of the target address, if there is a taken prediction. The bundle is finally presented to the consumers in the B5 cycle, where branch prediction redirection also occurs. Now, let's take a look at an example to see the pipeline with its internal self-redirection in action. Consider a pipeline restart to the beginning of line X. Within line X, there are two dynamically guessed, not taken, or DGNT branches. It isn't until line X plus 1 where there is a dynamically guessed taken or DGT branch to line Y. The branch prediction pipeline will start searching line X. Once it gets to the B5 cycle, it makes a prediction bundle with two DGNTs. Since we search 64 by sections each cycle, the predictor automatically started searching line X plus 1 in cycle 1. This search found the DGT to line Y with its prediction bundle presented in cycle 6. In that same cycle, the branch predictor redirected itself to start searching within line Y. Meanwhile, sequential searches for lines X plus 2 to X plus 5 are canceled. Now, besides the internal redirection, there are three consumers of the pipeline prediction bundle. First, the ICM. This is the iCache. Now, without any guidance from the branch predictor, the ICM would start instruction fetching after a pipeline restart and will continue fetching sequentially until the next pipeline restart. Since iFetching and the branch predictor both start at the same pipeline restart, the iCache would fetch sequentially to a DGT as broadcast from the branch predictor. Then the iCache redirects fetching to the target of the DGT and continues fetching sequentially until the next DGT and so on. The ICM sends the instruction text to the IDU or instruction dispatch unit. The IDU receives both DGT and DGNT branch location information. After the IDU receives and parses iText from the ICM, it will either apply a static prediction to any branches decoded, or if there is branch prediction information, the appropriate direction. The IDU ensures that only instructions within an address space that have been searched or cleared by the branch predictor can dispatch further into the pipeline. It's the stream and double quadrant offset previously mentioned that enables this synchronization. The IFB itself is also a consumer of both DGT and DGNT predictions. In order to make necessary branch prediction updates once a predicted branch resolves and completes, prediction state for each branch is saved for the duration of the branch's life in the core pipeline. It's at the final in-order stages of the pipeline where all branch prediction updates and writes take place. Now, from a high level, the Z15 branch predictor looks something like this. The blue components are the primary tables that are indexed in that B0 cycle of the branch prediction pipeline. Dynamic taken and not taken predictions are made in bundles originate from these structures, which provide and or override the target and direction predictions. The green components are not directly involved in the prediction itself, but are essential for proper function, accelerating throughput, and branch capacity. Let's look at each one individually. The BTP1 is the foundation of the branch predictor. All predictions that are made within a bundle must reside in the BTP1. It is virtual instruction address indexed and tagged and contains target and direction information for eight branches in each of its 2K rows via a branch target buffer for the target address and branch history table for the direction contained within. Total capacity for the BTP1 is 16,000 branches. In addition to the required hit information, target, and BHD states, additional metadata is also stored within each branch, such as knowledge that the branch exhibits multiple targets, is bi-unidirectional, amongst other things. 
Surprise branch installs and existing prediction updates are written into the BTP1 through a read, analyze, write buffer to eliminate duplicates and to ensure that only updates are made to existing predictions. Not directly contributing to a prediction bundle, but essentially extending the capacity of the BTP1 is the BTP2. It acts as a second level hierarchy of prediction metadata. Built using EDRAM cells for density, it has a capacity of up to 128K branches. Knowing when to transfer branches from the BTP2 into the BTP1 can be tricky. Unlike a traditional level 2 cache that is accessed upon a level 1 miss, a miss in the BTP1 doesn't necessarily mean there is content in the BTP2. It could just mean that there are no branches within the 64 byte section of code. The branch predictor uses a proxy of three consecutive BTP1 misses to indicate a transfer. These branches are written into the BTP1 through the same read, analyze, write buffer in order to gain access to the BTP1's write port. Now, even though all surprise branches are installed into the BTP2 as well as the BTP1, in order to maintain semi inclusivity, BTP1 state is periodically transferred into the BTP2. Every so often, a valid but not hit BTP1 entry is sent to the BTP2 for refreshing, since these are the most likely BTP1 branches next to be evicted through the LRU scheme. BTP1 will always have a direction and target prediction for consumption, but sometimes it needs a little help. That's where we employ various auxiliary predictors. Two auxiliary target predictors employed are the changing target buffer and the call return stack. These have the ability to override the BTP1 target prediction, but only if the BTP1 target first got a branch wrong target and is now exhibiting multi-target behavior. The CTB is the first pattern-based structure we'll encounter in our design. Each of the 2K rows is indexed using a function of a representation of the taken branch history up to this point, known as the global path vector. Every taken branch hashes down its instruction address and shifts that hash value into a vector that stores hashes of the past 17 taken branches. Further hashing this GPV vector yields the CTB index. The CTB is only used if the BTB1 indicates a multi-target branch and the CTB tag matches the address space undergoing search. Now, the Z architecture does not contain any explicit call nor return type branch instructions. Nevertheless, we employ a heuristic to determine if branches are exhibiting call return behavior. The number of 512 byte blocks or distance between a taken branch and its target address marks the branch as a possible caller whose next sequential instruction address or NSIA is placed onto the single entry stack. A one entry stack was a low cost addition to the design and provided sufficient performance. Populating the stack is done at completion and prediction time in a detection and application scheme, respectively. To detect possible returns, any taken branch whose target matches the NSIA is determined to be a return and is marked as such in the BTB1. Then at prediction time, as the stack is populated via the distance heuristic mechanism, any branch listed as a return simply uses the NSIA address on the stack as the target address. In a similar vein to the CTB and call return stack, auxiliary direction predictors are employed once a BTB1 prediction resolves with a branch wrong direction. Both of these use the same global path vector discussed with the CTB. First off are the pattern history tables, or PHT, which employ a two-page table structure with short and long index histories of 9 and 17 taken branch histories, respectively. Each PHT prediction has a two-bit saturating counter like the BHT to indicate strength and direction. Now, there are a multitude of components built into the TH system to ensure which table to install into, how to protect entries that are providing value, and how to select between multiple tables that may have weak predictions. A neural network-based perceptron predictor, despite its relatively small size with a capacity of only 32 branches, helps pick up the slack where the BHT and PHT fall short with difficult to predict branches. A collection of 6-bit weights is stored for each perceptron entry, and each weight is associated with one of two GPV bits in the history. The sign of the GPV bit dictates the sign of the weight. When all the weights are summed together, the sign of the result is the direction, taken or not, and the magnitude is an indicator of the confidence of the prediction. Adjustment of these weights is done at completion time. The entry first undergoes a training period, adjusting weight values. Once the overall magnitude is significant enough, the perceptron can then make predictions. Over time, the magnitude of each individual weight is assessed to see how well correlated it is to the current GPV bit. 
If it's hovering around zero, the other GPVit is selected. This process of virtualization allows us to build in a highly accurate perceptron predictor with a significantly reduced amount of hardware. Updates to the PHTs and perceptron is also performed non-speculatively at completion time with prediction information tracked through the core pipeline from prediction to completion in order to assess the merit of the actual prediction against its resolution and also what the alternate prediction would have yielded. Finally, we even have predictors on predictors to help accelerate throughput and to conserve power. The column predictor allows for faster re-indexing of the BTB1 by identifying the line where the exit point, or DGT, would be. Sometimes, there are simply no branches within a line being searched. The skip over offset mechanism, or SCOOT, stored as part of the metadata for each branch in the BTB1 and also in the CPRED, allows redirection to skip over lines known not to have any branches, eliminating unnecessary pipeline searches. For any stream that doesn't require the use of the PHT, Perceptron, or CTB, the CPRED can also power down these select structures if they are not needed for the next stream. Now let's walk through a couple examples to see these mechanisms in action. First, the CPRED without scoot. Once again, we have a restart to line X whose exit point is found in line X plus one to line Y. Instead of redirecting to line Y once the search for line X plus one reaches B5, the CPRED redirects prediction search to line Y in the B2 cycle. Prediction bundles, however, are still broadcast in the B5 cycle, but B5 cycles are now closer together, increasing prediction throughput. The B5 for line Y would have been in cycle 11 previously, but now it's three cycles earlier in cycle eight. Line Y, however, has no branches in it, so searching line Y yields no prediction bundle. This is where Scoot helps. Taking the example even further with Scoot enabled, we still see the line X plus one redirection in B2 cycle three, but instead of going to line Y, it skipped over line Y to line Y plus one since there was no value in searching line Y. The CPRED kicks in again, finding the exit point in line Y plus one to line Z in B2 cycle five, but Scoot skips over line Z since there is no branch contained within it, and the redirection takes prediction search straight to line Z plus one. As illustrated, the B5 prediction bundles are two cycles apart. We have accelerated our prediction search and increased our throughput of branch prediction bundles into the core pipeline. A few words now about making sure all this fancy branch prediction actually works and delivers performance. Two separate environments were used to ensure our algorithms were correct and that the design achieved its performance targets. The verification team employed white box verification. Now, unlike black box verification, where a simulation monitor drives inputs into a design and then monitors for expected outputs, white box verification goes further and examines signals within the design itself. Now, this was very important for branch prediction verification, since if the branch predictor is wrong, it's not going to produce a functional miscompare. The simulation environment maintained its own C++ model of the hardware that was driven by hardware events, sometimes the very hardware events and data it was monitoring for correctness. Granularity and flexibility is the advantage of such an approach. If the verification team finds a problem with the hardware, they can temporarily disable the monitor and continue testing other parts of the design, even if incorrect data is flowing through the pipeline. Of course, before tape out, we must ensure that there are no simulation monitors disabled. To ensure the design was going to and finally did deliver on performance targets, we also employed a different C++ model of the core pipeline for performance modeling purposes. This performance modeling platform was used throughout the design to validate and hone ideas and to confirm the final design was meeting performance expectations. So remember that the next time you pay with a credit card, get a bill in the mail, or shop for groceries, chances are you've just used a mainframe with this branch predictor navigating the core. On behalf of my fellow authors and of IBM, thank you for listening.